Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today we'll begin a whole new topic. We'll start looking deeply at gases, and this will be our first step in learning all about thermodynamics. The things we learn in the next few videos will help us all semester long. And to begin, today I want to tell you about the work of some of the earliest chemists of the modern age. These are the people who used what we now call the scientific method to study interesting compounds like gases. Before their work, chemistry as a science didn't really exist. Instead, people studied alchemy, which was the attempt to purify naturally occurring materials and find ways to use them. That sounds very scientific. Chemists tried to purify and find uses for materials too. However, alchemists tended to be very secretive. They were always afraid of having their ideas stolen by competitors, so they rarely described their discoveries in a realistic way. Plus, their work was clouded by mystical beliefs, including the idea that certain materials could give a person immortality, and it was the search for those materials that motivated a lot of alchemical research. Even worse, the notes kept by alchemists were often vague and imprecise. It wasn't until the 17th century that people studying compounds began to take more careful and well-written notes, and to use the scientific method to test their ideas and develop theories to explain what they saw. The person who's often regarded as the first chemist was Robert Boyle. Boyle actually was an alchemist and believed it was possible to transform less valuable metals into gold, which was something alchemists had been trying to do for hundreds of years. But he also took careful notes and designed experiments with controls, and he was particularly interested in gases. It had only recently become possible to make airtight containers he could use to study gases. Here's one that Boyle invented and used it in his experiments. He built it with the help of his assistant, Robert Hooke, who also went on to discover many properties of springs and pendulums, which you'll study if you take a course in physics. Another of Boyle's inventions was the first accurate device that could measure the pressure of a gas. You're probably familiar with barometers, which we use today to measure air pressure. You may even have one in your home, and you'll see the barometric pressure reported in weather forecasts on TV. Before we can talk about what Robert Boyle did, it'll be helpful to talk about what exactly pressure is. Let's imagine a rectangular box with a gas in it. The molecules of gas collide with the walls of the container, and that's the source of the pressure. So pressure is just the result of the force exerted by the collisions. In addition, the size of the container is important. If we shrink the box, but keep the number of molecules inside the same, those collisions will happen more often, so the pressure will increase. So the pressure is proportional to the force exerted by the molecules, and inversely proportional to the inner surface area of the container. But let's think about the units we're using. Force is usually measured in newtons, and area is square meters, so pressure could be measured in newtons per meter squared. That's an important enough unit that it actually gets its own name. It's called the Pascal, after the French mathematician Blaise Pascal. As it turns out, this is actually a fairly small pressure, so we often use a larger unit called a bar, which is equal to 100,000 pascals. So, we now have four different pressure units to think about. Millimeters of mercury, atmospheres, pascals, and bars. We can convert between these by using atmospheric pressure as a guide. As we saw earlier, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, and that's also equal to 101,325 pascals, or 1.01325 bars. Getting back to Robert Boyle, one of the most important discoveries he made is that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. In other words, if we double the pressure, the volume goes down by half. This is known as Boyle's Law, and we can express it this way. P1V1 equals P2V2. In this equation, P1 and V1 are the starting pressure and volume, and P2 and V2 are the pressure and volume at the end. The only thing to be careful about is that the units we use for pressure and volume have to be the same at the beginning and at the end. So, for example, if we measure V1 in liters, 
that's also what we need to use for v2. For example, if we have 2.54 liters of a gas at 985 millimeters of mercury, and we then drop the pressure all the way down to 390 millimeters of mercury, what will be the final volume? In order to find out, we'll just plug all this data into Boyle's Law. The thing we're trying to determine is V2, so we'll solve for that. When we do, we get a result of 6.42 liters. Notice that it wasn't necessary to convert millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. As long as P1 and P2 have the same unit, it doesn't matter what that unit is. As Boyle's Law predicts, the volume went up when the pressure went down. So, Boyle's Law tells us the connection between pressure and volume. Gases can be very difficult to study, so it took over a hundred more years before people figured out the connection between temperature and volume. That was done in 1787 by the French chemist Jacques Charles. One of the reasons it took so long was because new technology had to be created first. And just four years earlier, a brand new invention was made in France, the hot air balloon. Hot air balloons may seem like simple devices, but they were very new at the time, and it was the first time that human beings were ever able to fly in the air. It was an exciting development, and you can see the crowd of people at Versailles in this drawing who came to see one of the very first hot air balloons. As you might know, the air in a hot air balloon expands when we heat it with a flame. That reduces the density of the air inside, and that's what makes it float. Jacques Charles realized that this means there's a connection between a gas's temperature and its volume. It turns out that the volume and the temperature are directly proportional. That idea is known as Charles's Law, and we can express it with this equation. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. One thing that's important to note is that in this equation, the temperature must be in Kelvin. It doesn't work if you use Celsius temperatures. For example, Suppose we have a hot air balloon with a volume of 955,000 liters at a temperature of 55.2 degrees Celsius, and we then increase the temperature using a flame to 78.1 degrees Celsius. What will be the new volume of the balloon? We'll use Charles's Law to find the answer. We're looking for V2, so we'll just plug our data into the other variables. But remember, we need to use Kelvin for the temperature. Celsius will give us the wrong answer. We convert to Kelvin by adding 273.15 to the Celsius temperature. So we're starting at 328.4 Kelvin and ending at 351.3 Kelvin. I'll also convert that large volume into scientific notation just to make it a little shorter. When we perform the calculation, we find that V2 is 1.02 times 10 to the 6 liters. So, as Charles Law predicts, the volume went up when we increased the temperature. So Boyle's Law tells us how pressure and volume are connected, and Charles's Law tells us how temperature and volume are connected. There's one more gas law that I want to tell you about today. In 1811, the Italian physicist Amadeo Avogadro, the same guy that Avogadro's number is named for, realized something interesting about the volume of a gas and the number of molecules in it. First, he realized that the volume of a gas is proportional to the number of particles. That's called Avogadro's Law, and we can write it this way. This symbol means proportional to and the n here is the number of atoms or molecules in the gas. Usually, we measure that in moles. The other and much more surprising thing that Avogadro realized is that the volume of a given number of gas molecules is the same no matter what the gas is. So, if you have a million molecules of water, it takes up the same volume as a million molecules of helium or carbon dioxide, as long as the pressure and temperature are the same. This is actually a really surprising discovery, and here's why. Suppose we have a container full of hydrogen. If we could suddenly replace all the hydrogen with propane, 
It would take up the same volume even though the propane molecules are much larger. So a mole of hydrogen, a mole of water, a mole of propane, or a mole of any other gas all take up the exact same volume even though they're all different sizes. In 1834, the French physicist Emile Clapeyron noticed that all three of these relationships involve volume, so he combined them all into one equation. Here's how. First, notice that the volume is proportional to the number of moles. Next, Charles's law tells us that the volume is also proportional to the temperature, so the volume is proportional to n times t. Boyle's law tells us that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure, so V will be proportional to n times t divided by P, the pressure. Finally, notice that the volume is proportional to nt over P, not equal to it. If we want the exact value of the volume, we get it by multiplying the number on the right by a constant. We'll use the letter r for that constant. Now this is one way of writing what's known as the ideal gas law. We usually write it slightly differently though. We multiply both sides by p to get rid of the fraction, and we put the r in the middle of the right side so that we get pv equals nrt. As we'll see in a minute, this ideal gas law is one of the most useful equations about gases we have. First though, I want to tell you about that number r. That's called the gas law constant, and it always has the same value. Just like Avogadro's number, or the speed of light, it's a number you should try to memorize as soon as you can, because we'll use it often in the rest of this course, and in general chemistry too. R is equal to 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, divided by kelvins times moles. That's a complicated unit but it's really helpful to remember it because it tells you what the units need to be for everything else in the equation. So, the pressure needs to be in atmospheres. If you use millimeters of mercury, the units won't work out, and your answer will be an incorrect number. In the same way, the volume needs to be in liters, and the temperature needs to be Kelvin. Any other units will give you an incorrect result. So what can we do with this? Let's try an example. Suppose we have 500 millimeter can of spray deodorant containing 0 0.100 moles of gas at 25.0 degrees Celsius. What's the pressure inside the can? We'll use the ideal gas law to figure out the answer. We're trying to determine the pressure, P, so we'll just plug the other data into the equation. The volume is 500 milliliters. But remember, we need the units for volume to be liters, so we'll convert this to 0 0.500 liters. Next, we'll use 0 0.100 moles for N. R is the ideal gas law constant, 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. And T is the temperature, which needs to be in kelvins. So that's 298.15 kelvins. When we perform this calculation, we find that the pressure in the can is 4.89 atmospheres, almost five times atmospheric pressure, so that's what's in your can of spray deodorant. Let's try another example. Take a deep breath. Suppose your lungs hold about 5.00 liters of air. That's the average for the lungs of a healthy adult. How many moles of air are there in your lungs? We'll use the ideal gas law to figure this out. We're looking for n, and we'll plug the other data into the equation. P is the pressure. If you're at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 1.00 atmospheres, so that'll also be the pressure in your lungs. V is 5.00 liters, and R is 0 0.8206 liters atmospheres per Kelvin mole. What about the temperature? Well, if you hold the air in your lungs for a little while, it'll be at your body temperature, which is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37.0 Celsius. We'll convert that into Kelvin, which is 310.15 Kelvin. When we solve the equation, we find that N is equal to 
0.196 moles of air. So, the ideal gas law allows us to find the pressure, volume, temperature, or moles of any gas if we know the other three. But there's more that we can do with this equation, and this is what makes it especially useful. Suppose we have 500 mils of an unknown gas, and it weighs 0.408 grams. The temperature in the room is 25 degrees Celsius, and the pressure is 752 millimeters of mercury. With that information, we can figure out what the gas actually is. Here's how we do that. If you look at the ideal gas law, you'll see that we know P, V, and T. So we can use the equation to solve for N, the number of moles. Let's do that. We'll convert P to atmospheres, V to liters, and T to Kelvin. So we have a pressure of 0.989 atmospheres, a volume of 0.500 liters, and a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin. Solving the equation for N gives us 0.0202 moles. This makes it possible for us to figure out the molecular weight of the unknown gas. The molecular weight is measured in grams per mole. So, since we know the mass of our gas, and we know the number of moles, we can determine the molecular weight. It turns out that the molecular weight is 20.2 grams per mole. This information gives us a very good idea of the identity of the unknown gas. There aren't too many gases that have the exact same weight, so we can just look at a list of molecular weights of gases, and that'll narrow it down for us. It turns out that one of the only gases that weighs 20.2 grams per mole is neon, so that's probably what our unknown is. So, the ideal gas law is a very useful and practical tool we have in our toolkit. We can also write it this way. This quantity, called V bar, is just the volume per mole. The reason we sometimes use this quantity instead of just V is because the volume depends on the amount of sample. The bigger the sample, the larger the volume, of course. But the volume per mole is always the same at a particular pressure and temperature for any given gas. That kind of property, which is independent of the size of the sample, is called an intensive variable. So, V bar is an intensive variable. Meanwhile, a property like volume that does depend on the sample size is an extensive variable. As we'll see throughout this course, we often try to use intensive variables instead of extensive ones in our equations when we can, because they can often be treated like constants, which simplifies the equations quite a lot. For hundreds of years, it was very difficult to study gases because it takes some pretty sophisticated technology to make airtight containers where you can store gases and learn more about them. But that started to change in the 17th century, and by the end of the 19th, we had a pretty sophisticated idea of how gases behave and why. The most important theory about gases is called the kinetic theory. And in a nutshell, the basic idea is that the molecules in a solid are strongly attracted to each other, and the molecules in a gas are only weakly attracted. Kinetic theory was developed over a long period of time, but two of the most important founders of it were the Dutch physicist Daniel Bernoulli in 1738, and the German physicist Rudolf Clausius over a hundred years later in 1857. You're actually pretty familiar with some of the work of Daniel Bernoulli, even if you've never studied him in class before. He developed what's called the Bernoulli Principle, which says that an increase in the speed of a gas causes a drop in the pressure. It's one of the most important concepts that allows airplanes to fly. The top of an airplane's wing is shaped so that air flows faster over the top of the wing than over the bottom so the pressure above the wing is lower than on the bottom, and that pushes the airplane up. Bernoulli's principle is also what makes your shower curtain attack you when you take a hot shower. The hot air rising inside the shower causes a slight drop in pressure, so the air outside the shower pushes the curtain in. The other creator of kinetic theory was Rudolf Clausius, who built on Bernoulli's theories and stated the basic theory of gases that we still use today. 
The kinetic theory has five important points that will help us in the rest of this course. First, it says that the molecules in a gas are always in motion, and they move in random directions. The fact that they move in random directions is actually pretty important. Imagine if the air molecules in your room could all move in the same direction at once. That would mean the side of the room that the molecules have moved away from would suddenly contain a vacuum. We know that things like that don't happen. The next idea we get from kinetic theory is that the molecules in a gas are far apart from each other relative to the size of the molecules. That means that gases are mostly just empty space. The molecules themselves take up almost no volume. That's why when you boil just a tiny amount of water, the water vapor can take up a huge volume compared to the liquid you boiled to get it. The third idea we get from kinetic theory is that the molecules in a gas feel almost no attraction or repulsion for each other. You might remember that we said that the molecules in a liquid stick together because they feel forces that attract them to each other. According to kinetic theory, the gas molecules don't feel those forces anymore. The next idea from kinetic theory is that when gas molecules collide, energy might be transferred from one molecule to another, but the average kinetic energy of the molecules is constant. Another way of saying that is that the total amount of heat in the gas doesn't change. You can see that in this simulation. These gas molecules are colored according to the amount of their kinetic energy. Red molecules have the most energy, and blue ones have the least. When a high-energy molecule collides with a low-energy one, you can see that their energies change, but they still have the same average energy. You might recognize that as a very similar law to the law of conservation of energy, which we've talked about before. The last idea we get from kinetic theory is that this average kinetic energy we've been talking about is proportional to the temperature. So, if the temperature of a gas is high, what that means is that the molecules have a high kinetic energy. All the gas laws we've studied so far, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, and the ideal gas law, are all based on the kinetic theory of gases. But unfortunately, the kinetic theory makes a couple of assumptions that aren't very realistic. First, because the molecules in a gas are so far apart, the kinetic theory makes the approximation that the molecules themselves don't actually take up any space at all in the gas. Of course, that's not really true. The molecules really do take up some space in the container, even though it's not very much. The other assumption the kinetic theory makes is that the molecules don't attract or repel each other. This also isn't true. We know that all molecules contain protons and electrons. So the electrons in one molecule will repel the electrons in the other molecules and will attract protons in the other molecules. Because the molecules stick to each other when they're attracted, they collide with the walls of the container with more force. That means the pressure will be higher than expected. So to make the ideal gas law more accurate, we shouldn't just use P. We'll talk about those intermolecular forces that affect the pressure of a gas in the next video. It's a really fundamental concept for many chemical phenomena, so I hope you'll join me for that one. But until next time, have a good week. <laughs>